All right, guys. Bang, bang. I've got Darius here with me. Uh, Darius, Secretary Yellen is in charge. She's got a big, big responsibility, but she's making some pretty important decisions lately. Um, Let's just dive into Q2 quarterly refunding announcement. And what does that mean? And why is she doing this? Yeah, appreciate you, Prop. Thanks for having me back on the show, man. It's always good to be here. So um, let's just start by explaining what the quarterly refunding announcement is for investors who may not be familiar. Uh, That's when the Treasury outlines its net financing uh, uh, estimates uh, for the uh, current and upcoming quarter. Uh, And then they also provide their projections for uh, things like the Treasury general account balance, which is essentially the Fed's checking account at the Fed, Fed, or sorry, the Treasury's checking account uh, at the Federal Reserve. Uh, And then there's a lot of other information in there as well. But the things that matter most to market participants are here on slide one, are one of the things that matters most is here on slide one. And that's the data that we get on Wednesday or Monday afternoon in the QRA, uh, which is the privately held net marketable borrowing totals uh, for the current quarter and the next quarter, uh, and then the uh, end of quarter Treasury general account balance total. So uh, so for the current quarter, uh, they're forecasting uh, having to borrow $243 billion of net marketable borrowing from the private sector. Uh, that's up from 40, that's up 41 billion uh, from the, uh, where they projected Q2 to be uh, in the Q1 quarterly funding announcement. And then uh, what I thought was pretty hawkish uh, is the when you look at the next quarter estimates uh, for, uh, for 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 privately held net marketable borrowing, they skyrocket six hundred and four uh, billion dollars to eight hundred forty seven billion, uh, and that increase to eight hundred forty seven billion uh, is going uh, simultaneously alongside a hundred billion dollar increase uh, in the Treasury general account balance. So uh, this is a Treasury that, in our opinion, uh, Jenny Yellen is using the Q two quarterly refunding announcement at least the first day of it. Uh, we'll get another update on, on Wednesday. Uh, but the first day of that, uh, she's using it to send a hawkish signal to market participants. Now, is the signal working? Yeah, I mean, in recent weeks, right? Like, so if you go, uh, if you look at slide two in this chart where we show, we unpack the different uh, dynamics of our net liquidity model, which is essentially everyone's net liquidity model now. We we, we invented this model a few years ago. Uh, this is uh, it's the tra- a Fed balance sheet, uh, the total assets on the Fed balance sheet minus the Treasury General account balance and the reverse equal facility balance. And, uh, you know, subtracting those two balances uh, gives us a clearer indication of uh, where, you know, net liquidity is on the Fed balance sheet as it pertains to bank reserves. And so uh, up until, you know, really for throughout most of 2023, uh, the, tr- the, the, the Treasury was doing things from a net financing standpoint uh, that was specifically and expressly designed to tap into the excess of funds that were fully stored on the Fed's balance sheet in the form of the reverse repo facility balance. Uh, and the reverse equal facility balance, which the Fed uses uh, to mop up excess liquidity in the financial system uh, in order to maintain the floor on the policy rate uh, corridor, uh, that that balance has declined from about two and a half trillion dollars uh, at the beginning of 2023 uh, to only five hundred and six billion dollars uh, currently, uh, as a function of the policy that the uh, Janet Yellen and her cronies at the Treasury uh, were implementing, and that was a boost to liquidity, as a boost to asset markets throughout that time period. Well, if you see over the past kind of week or so, or really, really since the beginning of April, uh, we've seen both the RRP uh, and the TGA balance, Treasury General Account balance, uh, move in a direction that is less supportive for liquidity, that drains liquidity, i.e. both balances have gone up. Uh, we are now at $506 billion, again, in terms of the RRP, and we're up at $910 billion from the perspective of the TGA. Got it. And then when we go and we take a look at like uh, the market liquidity, I guess like one story that you and I have talked about over the last couple of months is China was putting tons of liquidity in the market. America was trying to drain. There was this like back and forth battle between it. It seems like now uh, and on slide three, you have Secretary Yellen's decision to flood the market with bills was a contributing factor to this decline. It's like talk a little bit as to uh, how that plays into some of this. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, um, you know, again, so if you go back and think about the types of funds that are uh, you being, being that, that actually allocate to the reverse equal facility, uh, it's typically money market funds. Uh, it's money market funds that are mm-hmm. the safety of the Fed's balance sheet or the overnight uh, liquidity uh, relative to uh, a T bill instrument, an instrument uh, that those are the treasury securities that mature uh, in under a one year time horizon. And so if you go and you sort of look at uh, uh, the uh, composition of net marketable borrowing over the last 12 months through Q1, uh, the, tr- the 69% of total net marketable borrowing was financed in the bill market, which is very anomalous relative to history because only uh, if you look at uh, total net market borrowing uh, across the $27 trillion uh, that the, the Treasury has borrowed thus far from the private sector, uh, only 23% of that uh, thus far is, is in the T bill market. And so for her to dump, you know, su- supply uh, 70% of total net market borrowing in the bill market, in our opinion, is an explicit signal that 
uh, she was trying to create uh, uh, both liquidity and spread dynamics that would cause funds to flow off the RRP. And, and she was quite successful at doing that. Yeah. And then investors, they were concerned. Are they still concerned? Yeah. So what we show on slide four is the uh, a composition of nominal net marketable borrowing. Uh, and so we show, again, the bills, the blue bars and the red bars are the uh, are the coupon issuance. And we see that uh, bills uh, were projected to decline by $245 billion uh, here in Q2. And this is largely as a function. We typically see that in the second quarter of the year. Uh, that's typically a function of the Treasury expecting uh, to get uh, a, a significant amount of tax uh, increases uh, or sorry, tax tax receipts. Uh, and so they typically uh, cause bills to go down in Q2. Uh, but what was, um, you know, what was quite concerning and investors were right to be concerned about that, because ultimately what it means is that the decline in the RP that has been a positive tailwind for asset markets since this early part of 2023 uh, was likely to stall out. And uh, we've seen it stall out uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and more, and perhaps more importantly, uh, we saw coupons actually increase to $447 billion. So on a net basis, when you think about treasury net financing policy, you know, it's a, it creates a, essentially a crowding out effect uh, for broader asset markets, right? The U.S. dollar, you and I talked about this a few years ago, uh, but the, 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 the U.S. Treasury is at the very top of the global capital structure. When the Treasury issues debt, everyone, we all have to make room to absorb that debt because it is the world's uh, reserve currency and the world's reserve uh, sort of liquidity management, uh, preferred liquidity management tool. Uh, and so, you know, whenever they uh, issue coupons, which are you know, interest bearing securities uh, that have a duration uh, and that, that increase the overall portfolio risk for any investor that's, you know, onboarding those securities, uh, then that's when you start to see some indigestion in asset markets as investors have to create that that space, if you will, uh, to uh, to absorb those coupons. Got it. And then on this last slide that you've got here, this like net marketable borrowing uh, and the TGA, um, explain this a little bit more because I probably don't understand this nearly as well as, uh, as you do. Today's episode is brought to you by Proppy. Imagine a world where you could buy and sell your home wallet to wallet. With Prop Keys, you can mint your home address and upgrade it to a real world asset. This not only protects your home's title from fraud, but when you are ready to move, you can sell it through an NFT auction as well as through the traditional way. There's optionality here. Proppy Keys is part of the Proppy ecosystem. Their mission is to make home ownership more efficient, affordable, and user-friendly. Proppy Keys is a fun entry point to placing title on the blockchain. Now, anyone can start their on-chain journey by minting home addresses via Proppy Keys and staking them for profit until they are ready to sell their home. Visit proppykeys.com to learn more. Again, that's proppykeys.com to learn more. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, going back to the discussion, you know, so, uh, you know, we'll go back to slide three really quickly, you know, where we show that, you know, the yellow was explicitly targeting the bill market in order, in our opinion, to uh, uh, release funds, trapped funds from the RP into asset markets and into the economy. Well, uh, that's been the spark call because if you look at on slide five, uh, where we show the spread between uh, 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 market observed rates and the, and the weighted average interest rate on various uh, segments of the treasury market. And so the spread gives you an indication of, okay, where is it most expensive and least expensive uh, for the treasury to issue uh, issue debt? And so at the top, we show uh, the seven-year treasury yield minus the weighted average interest rate on all marketable debt. Uh, and the seven-year treasuries is sort of corresponds to the uh, weighted average maturity of all uh, marketable debt. It's a little bit over six six years. So uh, that plus 93 basis point spread suggests that, hey, if the Treasury is just to issue uh, a, a, a you know, six and a half year Treasury uh, instrument, uh, they'd be paying roughly 93 basis points higher today than they would on their existing portfolio of Treasuries. Uh, when you go and you look at that same spread across the various segments of the Treasury market, it's pretty clear to see that the bill is the bill market is where she's getting the most uh, did most of the, the largest discount, really the only discount. You know, and minus 35 basis points. Uh, if you look at the uh, the spread between mar- observe rates in the notes market relative to the five year treasury yield, that's 180 basis points positive spread. So they would cost them money. It would it, it would raise the overall weighted average effective interest rate on their notes portfolio. Uh, if you look at it on a 10 year uh, rated average interest rate on bonds, that was 180 basis 808 basis points positive. So that would raise the weighted average effective interest rate on their bond portfolio. Same dynamic with tips market as well. That's about 114 basis points. So. That minus 35 basis points we see there suggests to us that, hey, Janet, Treasury Secretary Yellen, when she outlines the composition of the net marketable borrowing for the uh, for, for, for Q2 or for Q3, really, uh, in, in tomorrow morning's uh, part two of the QRA, she should. It makes the most economic sense to continue targeting the bill market because that's where the discount is. However, if we see uh, an increase in coupon supply and or an increase in bond supply, 
in our opinion, that would be a very explicit signal that she's actually trying to create a duration risk in, in, in global investor portfolios, because ultimately that would tighten financial conditions and a tightening of financial conditions is likely to slow inflation. And that's exactly what President Biden needs. If you look at the most recent polls uh, going back to last week, you know, he uh, he had a narrow lead in a lot of swing states, but that has evaporated. And I want to say he's only leading uh, in Michigan. And the reason for that, uh, at least that's what's been cited uh, broadly by political uh, strategists, is that inflation continues to be the real big issue for him on the economic front. And so, you know, rather than uh, uh, continue to goose asset markets by creating policy, by, by creating net financing policy that uh, causes you know more money to flow into asset markets and more money to flow into the economy, it may be the case that here in Q2 and in Q3, the Treasury Department is actually shifting uh, uh, their uh, net financing policy in a way that tightens financial conditions and actually has a depressing impact on inflation, which could potentially uh, help save Biden uh, his election bid, the re-election bid. How, how should we expect this stuff to impact asset prices? Uh, obviously, inflation is kind of one component of it. We're going into an election year. I think a lot of people are looking at all the geopolitical conflict and, and they're saying to themselves, like, how do I position my portfolio to just like protect myself, to you know be prepared for the maybe unknown, understanding some of these dynamics that are playing? Yeah, 100 percent, man. So in our opinion, it's always about understanding what the dominant drivers of markets are in the context of the positioning cycle. Those are the, in my opinion, if you're trying to make medium term calls on asset al- on asset allocations uh, in terms of, you know, getting more bullish or bearish or you know taking up your gross exposure or net exposure to a particular asset class or taking that down, you need to understand the evolution of the dominant drivers of asset markets at any given time, particularly relative to uh, the dominant drivers of the positioning cycle at any given time. And and, it, and right now, we, we kind of look at and survey the global macro landscape, and that's something that obviously we do uh, at a very high level for our clients here, our, our institutional and retail clients here, according to Macro, which is help them understand all the moving parts with the full distribution of probable economic outcomes looks like. And from a moto outcome perspective, uh, we continue to see, uh, continue to get confidence in our resilient U.S. economy thing that thing's been active uh, since uh, middle of the summer of 2022. Uh, that was the thing we authored back then. Uh, uh, and then with respect to the right tail risk, things that are still uh, uh, active our, our, our green shoots globally theme, we continue to see positive dynamics out of the, the global economy from a leading indicator perspective. Uh, our China front-loading stimulus thing, we continue to receive uh, uh, sort of confirmation uh, from you know leading and the coincident indicators from China that suggest BBOC is likely to continue supplying liquidity over the medium term. Uh, but what is new and has is, is suddenly become a dominant driver of asset price, prices and ultimately the positioning cycle that could cause uh, asset prices to unwind from the current trends is the fact that Sticky inflation is now a dominant theme uh, here in the U.S. economy, and the outcome of sticky inflation is causing uh, some indigestion with respect to uh, U.S. and global liquidity. And the reason it's doing that is because the dollar is really starting to break out. The dollar has broken out. Uh, uh, it's now bullish from the perspective of our volatility, just a momentum signal. And one of the most important things investors need to know is that the dollar is one of the most uh, uh, countercyclical, one that has the highest inverse correlation on a coincident basis. Uh, to global liquidity, uh, has a very high cor- inverse correlation, uh, or sorry, a uh, bond market volatility and currency market volatility, which the dollar tends to be positively correlated with, also have a very high uh, inverse correlations uh, to uh, uh, global liquidity on a coincident basis. And so what we're saying now is sort of put the, piece, the pieces of the puzzle together. We're saying some of the things that have been bullish for asset markets, particularly on the economic front and on the stimulus front out of, out of, the, the, out of, out of Asia, are becoming less important to markets. And what's becoming more important to markets is stickiness of inflation in the US and ultimately how the Fed and Treasury are either going to respond to that, which we just talked about with respect to the Treasury, or going to ignore it and actually do, you know, sort of uh, be forced to do nothing about it. Uh, because right now we're moving from a condition where both the Fed and Treasury's policies on a net financing basis and on a, a forward guidance basis were explicitly dovish for most of, much of the past six months. And we are now moving into a period where they're perhaps going to be explicitly hawkish or at the bare minimum, just hawkish at the margins, uh, which is a much less bullish backdrop for asset markets. And when you kind of uh, look through this, um, should we expect this stuff to change or are we already in the like, whatever they call like the election playbook, right? And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the Treasury or the Federal Reserve is like actually looking at the election, but just like it does feel like there's these four year cycles. It does feel like there's people starting to talk about this stuff. They are paying attention. There is, you know, uh, uh, at least the accusation of if you don't start cutting now, you're going to wait till you're closer towards the election. It does have an impact, whatever. Like, are we already kind of 
whatever is in motion now, we should continue to expect to be in motion by November? Or do you think that there are like a pivot point where we could go from, hey, we've got one kind of approach today, end of summer, we could pivot and be in a whole different regime by election time? Yeah, that's uh, that's 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 that very much could be the case. I mean, in our opinion, going back to the, you know, we're trying to play this from a game theory perspective, start by thinking, OK, what does President Biden want? Because he's going to have some influence over how the Treasury chooses to enact policy. Right. The Treasury has, you know, the Treasury knows the budget deficit is going to be, generally speaking. But how they choose to finance the budget deficit it, it are, you know, sort of uh, you know, discretionary uh, choices by by nature. And so they can do things that are, I guess, more supportive for what the administrators objectives are or less supportive. Uh, depending on uh, the relationship there. And obviously, Yellen has a very positive relationship with Joe Biden. Uh, and so in our opinion, you know, when you think about this from the perspective of just isolating the election, you know, typically elections are actually quite bullish. Uh, stocks typically perform well uh, into presidential elections. You know, if you look at on a, so we're right, right around, you know, it's called six months out, out, out of the election or six months out before the election. You know, the six months leading up to an election with data going back to uh, the 1948 election, uh, the median return for the S&P is plus 4% with an 84% percent positive ratio. And then that if you have a Democratic incumbent running, uh, the median return doubles to about plus 8%. And this is a six-month return prior to the election. And so that's the baseline. We're not saying you have to expect the baseline, but any any statistic, any back test with such a high percent positive ratio tells you that there are underlying and structural and more importantly, stable market forces that are causing that. And so in our opinion, you know, I think it doesn't you know, it doesn't necessarily pay to be a bear heading into election unless you have very specific uh, high probability catalysts on the bear side uh, that are likely to materialize and become dominant drivers of asset markets uh, before the election. And one of the things that we're doing a uh, tremendous amount of research on is trying to understand the interplay between sticky inflation and what the Treasury Fed's policy responses are likely to be uh, to the uh, advent of sticky inflation as a dominant market theme. And then really, you know, we're kind of very much in that debate process. But the early indications of that debate process are certainly moving uh, in a hawkish direction, as we highlighted uh, in the previous slides. Where can we send people to find you or find out more about 42 Macro? I appreciate you for having me, man. Thanks again, as always. Uh, so if you guys like staying on the right side of market risk, if you like uh, you know, making money in bull markets and protecting gains in bear markets, then definitely come check us out uh, at 42macro.com. I'm on Twitter, DariusDale42. So uh, if your goal is to just be educated, uh, we're happy to do that as well. So uh, come check us out on Twitter as well. So we appreciate you guys. I uh, I learn something every time we talk, my friend. And I always appreciate how much time and effort you put into not only the charts, but also the insights. So we'll definitely do it again in the future. And I appreciate you, brother. Thank you for all that you do as well, man.